Hello and welcome back to CCRN Review. This is Neurologic Part 3. So here we're going to start by talking about some different monitoring devices we can use to monitor the patient's intracranial pressure. So first of all, let's start over on the left-hand side there. And you can see we have a ventriculostomy drain. And this is put all the way down into the ventricle. We're able to monitor intracranial pressure. We're able to pull off CSF. So obviously, this is a very useful type of an instrument. However, it is also very invasive. Since we're going all the way down through all the layers on the outside there, the dura, etc. And then we're going down into the brain tissue and into the ventricle actually. So intraparenchymal fiber optic catheter is the second one we see there. And now we're getting into the brain tissue itself and we're trying to take a look at some of the brain tissue. So it's, and this is measuring our oxygen and CO2, et cetera, of the brain tissue. We have our epidural transducer. That's the third one we see, the kind of the green lead wire on it. And the epidural transducer is going to give us pressures. We can't draw off CSF, but we can get a pressure from our epidural transducer. Well, one of the problems that we have with some of these, like the epidural, the subdural, etc., is that they are all peripheral, so they're around the outside. And if we happen to have a lesion that is close to the catheter, then our pressures will be higher in that area than they would be in the rest of the brain, in the rest of the skull. The next one, the blue one, is a subdural catheter. You see it goes down below the dura. So now we're down into the CSF. We can draw off CSF and we can measure pressures here. So that's also very nice. Subdural bolt is the next one over. So this is just a little bit more permanent type of a device. And uh, the subdural bolt it allows us to do the same things from that dural space. So when we hook one of these devices up to a monitor, we expect to see a waveform that looks something like this. And when you're looking at this waveform, probably the first thing you thought of was, oh, that looks like an art line. We have a systolic upsweep, we have a diastolic notch, and we have that diastolic downsweep. So we have all of those same components we see with an art line, we're seeing here with the normal waveform that we see with our intracranial pressure. The reason for that is, is the changes that occur within intracranial pressure on a second-by-second -second basis are related to blood pressure. So as that patient's blood pressure goes up, we see that systolic sweep up, and then we get the dichrotic notch and then down into the diastolic, just like you would with your art line. So it's going to look like the same kind of waveform. Now, one of the reasons why this is important to know is that we want to see a complex like this. We don't want to see this flattened out line. If we just see like a flattened out line there, then we've got some dampening going on and we may not be getting a good, accurate reflection. Now, if we were to take a whole bunch of that previous waveform that we had and compress it together, you see here, see the time on the bottom, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15. So this is one little spot here, about the same equivalent space as a six-second strip, but we have 20 minutes. So what we've done is we've compressed. So when you see that, it kind of looks like hair up here with the A-wave, all that little moving of that the uh, waveform what that is is it's those complexes we were talking about and those complexes are all squeezed together into this so what we're looking at with an a wave was we're looking at a sustained high increase in intracranial pressure now look at that that intracranial pressure is above 50. Okay, so that's really huge Cerebral perfusion pressure is our mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. So if we're going to maintain an, a cerebral perfusion pressure of 70 in this patient, we would have to have a mean arterial pressure of 120. Let me repeat that. We would have to have a mean arterial pressure of 120. How likely is that going to happen? Yes, that, that would be really very hypertensive. The second wave you see happening there in the middle, that's called the B wave. It doesn't go up as high, but it's still in the 20s. Okay, so we're still getting a sustained increase. This happens basically from our nursing care. 
Okay, so we've stimulated the patient, maybe we're turning the patient, cleaning the patient, and you know, we tend to try to bunch all of our activities together so that we're only bothering that patient infrequently, right? Well, what happens with the neural patient is if we do a bunch of activities at the same time, then we will get this spasm that's evidenced by this B wave. So we'll have this sustained increase in intracranial pressure as a result of doing all these activities. Now, if we were to stop, then it would start to go back down to the baseline again. However, if we're able to spread out our activities and not cluster them, we will find that we're able to keep that from happening and we don't have that sustained increase in intracranial pressure. The other type we see over there on the right hand side is called a C wave and this is kind of a gentle rolling up and gentle rolling down of the pressures and as a result of breathing and moving and things like that. So that's normal we don't expect uh, any problems with that um, but that's just kind of the gentle rolling pattern that we see that happens with breathing in and out. So intracranial pressure monitoring, there's a number of different devices we can use. Uh, this picture over on the right hand side is showing a BIS monitor. So this is a, a type of external monitor that will monitor oxygen saturation. One of the important components to know about cerebral perfusion pressure and ICP monitoring is that we are looking at how much pressure is actually occurring in the brain. So what is the perfusion pressure that's happening up there in the brain? It doesn't really matter so much what our blood pressure is, but we need to know if our blood pressure is sufficient to overcome the intracranial pressure. And that's why we're looking at cerebral perfusion pressure. As I mentioned before, we'd like to see that our cerebral perfusion pressure is about 70. So this tells us a little bit about uh, what's going on and whether or not our brain is being perfused. We can also take a look at our jugular venous oxygen saturation or cerebral oxygenation, like with the BIS monitor, for example. But our jugular venous oxygen saturation, now that's giving you venous, right? Okay, so normal is 60 to 75% because we're looking at the venous blood. We're not looking at arterial blood. What this tells us is how much oxygen is being used by the brain. So if the brain is using too much oxygen, if we're having a, a, an increase in our oxygen consumption by the brain, we will see that drop in the same way that we would see our SVO2 drop. So a non-invasive or a couple non-invasive methods here, the Invos cerebral oximeter and the BIS monitor, these are two different types of monitors that can monitor our cerebral oxygenation and the BIS monitor can also monitor our brain activity. So it can, it can give us an idea as to what our metabolism is and how well our brain is working. Management of an increased intracranial pressure, what we're seeing over here on the right hand side is a patient who has some uh, cerebral edema. Notice the midline shift that is occurring there. You see the midline kind of outlined with that white line that's going down kind of toward the middle, except it's shifted over toward the right hand side. Vasogenic edema is a disruption of the blood-brain barrier, so fluid leaks out. It allows fluids and proteins to leak into the brain tissue. Now, this is important because if we just give this patient a little bit of Lasix or we give the patient some kind of diuretic, for example, it's not necessarily going to pull that fluid back out. The etiology of vasogenic edema, trauma, ischemia, tumor, infection, brain abscesses, cytotoxic edema, so hypoxic injury causes swelling. So, and this could be secondary. So this could be primary from a stroke or it could be secondary as a result of having pressure on the brain tissue. So our initial edema may cause secondary hypoxic injury. But at any rate, we have hypoxic injury causing swelling and the etiology again, cerebral hemorrhage, hypoosmolar states, trauma. Interstitial edema is the third type. So we have an increase in our CSF production or a decreased removal. 
So what's happening on a regular basis is that we have CSF being produced and we're removing it. About 150 mLs per day of CSF is being produced and at the same time it's also being removed and it's excreted, it's gotten rid of so we don't have too much CSF on board. However, if we have a blockage of the removal of the CSF, we can end up having a problem with too much CSF. And then the CSF can start leaking out into the tissue instead of just being uh, nicely contained. So this mechanism of secondary injury, and, and this encompasses some of those pieces that we were just talking about, is we have the local injury occurring, which then causes local edema to the brain. That decreases blood flow locally. That decrease in blood flow locally is going to cause more edema and more ischemia globally, which decreases blood flow globally and causes further decreases in blood flow locally. So we get this secondary injury occurring in parts of the brain that were not damaged because of the swelling and inflammation that occurred as a result of the primary injury. Symptom-wise, we'd anticipate seeing a decreased level of consciousness, alterations in thought process, headache, nausea, vomiting, sensory loss. So all those things you associate with changes in neural status with this patient with an increase in intracranial pressure. Multi-system effects, we can see EKG changes. So uh, some of those are shown here, T-wave changes, ST-segment elevation or depression. So this is a patient here who has increased intracranial pressure. And you can see the ST-segment elevation. Q-waves could be possible or dysrhythmias. In managing our neuro patient, we want to try to balance this ventilation perfusion train that we've talked about. On the one side, on the left side here, we have our FiO2, and that's the oxygen delivered to the lungs. In order to get it to the tissues, we need to have a mechanism to do that. That's our hemoglobin. But uh, having bunches of hemoglobin and lots of FiO2 doesn't do anything unless we have something to move it to the tissues. It's like the locomotive on the train is our cardiac output. Well, we finally, we bring all this oxygen over to the tissues, but if we did not meet the need at the tissue level, then uh, we still haven't met the need. We'll still have a deficit. So think about this like riding on a train. If we have a bunch of people here at that second hospital that we need to uh, bring over some extra help for them and they need 2,000 people. Well, we fill up that train and we only have 500, right? So we get it over to that second hospital and we unload it and those 500 people, well, we still haven't met the need. The need was for 2,000, right? So all of these components need to be optimized if we're going to get enough oxygen to the tissue. And that's true of the brain tissue too. So it's not just a matter of managing intracranial pressure. It's not just a matter of managing the brain. It's also a matter of managing FiO2, hemoglobin, cardiac output. And in many cases in neuro patients, we may have to have a higher blood pressure in order to maintain cardiac output and overcome cerebral per or, or the intracranial pressure, allowing us to have adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. So interventions, cerebral perfusion uh, is one of the things we're going to want to do is to reperfuse maybe by using thrombolytics, anticoagulants, or maybe angiography. Oxygenation is important, supply and demand, so increasing the supply, decreasing the demand. We decrease the demand by the brain, that means we want that person to do less. The more they do, the higher the demand for oxygen in the brain. So we want them to be sedated, we don't want them doing for themselves, etc. We can increase our FiO2, maybe giving the patient some O2 and we'll take a look at our PO2 FiO2 ratio increase our cardiac output, and, de and decrease our oxygen consumption. Other interventions include hyperventilation. Oftentimes we've used hyperventilation in our patients with increased intracranial pressure for years, really. Uh, the effects, though, are temporary. 
So, and we must sustain the hyperventilation in order to be able to maintain any kind of effect at all. But the effect is going to start to be temporary. And so the, the, here's when it's useful is if we're going to send that patient down to the OR and we need to try and decrease intracranial pressure, yeah, hyperventilate, right? But if our patient is in the ICU and they have an increased intracranial pressure, hyperventilation is only going to be a temporary fix. And then we're going to have somebody with respiratory alkalosis who still has increased intracranial pressure. Steroids decrease inflammation, so we may be using those. Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic, so that may be helpful in decreasing the volume of fluid that's up in the brain, helping to pull some of that off. It also has a neuroprotective effect. It's an antioxidant. So mannitol would be helpful in trying to prevent that secondary injury to the brain cells. We would like to decrease our metabolic activity by decreasing the patient's activity and decreasing their temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the metabolic activity. And this is one of the reasons why we're going to use hypothermia in our patients who have VFib out of hospital arrest is because by decreasing the temperature, we decrease the metabolic activity of the brain. So here's some hemodynamic effects with vasodilation and vasoconstriction in the brain. If we get vasodilation, we'll drop the blood pressure, we'll increase the CO2, our oxygen, low oxygen levels. All of those things cause vasodilation in the brain, decrease pH. Uh, vasoconstriction is caused by an increase in blood pressure, a decrease in CO2, an increase in oxygen, and an increase in pH. So those are the things that are going to cause our patient to develop vasoconstriction in the brain. Neurosurgery may be necessary to relieve the pressure or remove bleeds, clots, or tumors, or to clip an aneurysm. So craniostomy, a craniotomy can encourage herniation though if the patient has intracerebral hemorrhage, so be careful of that situation. Care for craniotomies, uh, washing the hair is acceptable, so well, we can do that, get some of the blood out, etc. Avoid submerging the cranium during washing, be gentle when handling the area. Okay? It's just, in many cases we take the bone out, and so this is just skin over top of the brain. Ensure safety. Complications include bleeding, edema, surgical site infection, seizures, CSF contamination, uh, very you know, very easy to contaminate the CSF during this process. A pneumocephalus, which means we have air that got into the skull uh, when the surgery was done. Stroke and even death. Burr holes are another type of intervention. We use a special drill that permanently removes a small circle of bone from the patient's skull. Uh, the initial procedure is often used as an emergent type of procedure, life-saving, you know, trying to get that intracranial pressure down. So we may do some burr holes to try to relieve some of the intracranial pressure, especially if there's some blood or there's fluid that could be relieved at the same time. Uh, they also use it to locate clots or maybe to use it for a biopsy. It can be converted, so if we make four of those holes kind of in a square pattern, they can convert it to a craniotomy flap. And so then the surgeon would just go in there and kind of connect the dots and pull out that piece of bone. Uh, that piece of bone then would be saved. We either, either freeze it or they put it into the abdominal cavity and uh, to keep it healthy until the time at which when they can put it back. But it does allow for the brain and the brain, uh, the tissue around the brain to swell during this acute period of time and help to get the intracranial pressure down. Well, thanks for joining me for Neurologic Part 3 of the CCRN Review. You're doing great. Keep up the good work and let's keep going.